Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call this session to order. This is the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. My name is Eric Arneson from the George Washington University. I'm the co-chair of the seminar, along with Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, as many of you know, but perhaps uh, some of you who don't, uh, this seminar is a long-standing collaborative project of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars on the one hand uh, and the National History Center on the other. Uh, and each week, typically on Mondays, but uh, clearly today is an exception, uh, we bring historians and public policy analysts to Washington to discuss recent work or recent research uh, that touches upon uh, issues of national and international policy and importance. Uh, Behind the scenes, there are a number of folks who ensure that this seminar comes off week after week without a hitch. Uh, Amanda Perry of the National History Center and Pete Bierstecker directing people hopefully to the inside chairs here where we have multiple seats uh, available uh, are, are two indispensable forces uh, who keep this seminar uh, running uh, every single week. Putting on seminars like this uh, is something that requires some institutional support uh, and financial support. Uh, and the Department of History at GW is one such institutional supporter. And we are also reliant upon a variety of anonymous donors. And as I never tire of saying, we invite you to join their ranks um, sooner rather than later, but at least uh, at some point. Um, if you have one of these devices, and I think every single person in this room will have to admit to that. If you would please turn it to off or to silent, we would very much appreciate it. Uh, and with that, uh, I will ask Christian Osterman to introduce our speaker today. Christian. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Wilson Center and this national, uh, this Washington History Seminar. Um, delighted to um, introduce Professor Adam Tooze today. He's um, had, the, had the privilege of uh, listening to his talk, an earlier version of this talk at the um, um, American Academy in Berlin last spring. Um, uh, so I can tell you you're in for, for a treat. Um, Adam is the author of Wages of Destruction, winner of the Wolfson and Longman History Today Prize. He's the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of History at Columbia University, where he directs the European Institute. He has formerly taught at Yale, um, he, where he was Director of International St Security Studies and at the University of Cambridge. He has worked in executive development with several major corporations and contributed to uh, the National Intelligence Council. He has written and reviewed for a variety of prominent journals, uh, Foreign Affairs, Financial Times, The Guardian, and so forth. Um, I'll spare you the long list just to say that he is a prolific and very well-published um, speaker and scholar, and we're absolutely delighted to have him here today. Um, as a reminder, as you're shutting down your various devices. Thank you for doing that now and not later. Um, next week, we have with us Melanie McAllister um, talking about the kingdom of God has no borders, a global history of American evangelicals. With that, Adam, you have the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about are some of the themes that are, are highlighted in this book, Crash, that came out a, a month or so ago. And I've been doing a lot of talks uh, in relation to uh, the book. Uh, it has many, many strands. Um, and obviously, the release of the book was driven by an anniversary. Uh, it was driven by the 10th anniversary of the failure of Lehman Brothers on the 15th of September. So this is a particularly mad week in my life. Um, but as I was going into work today, uh, I realized that, of course, uh, particularly in New York, it's the anniversary of another event. Uh, this is uh, Columbia campus this morning. And rather on the spur, uh, I decided to change my talk. So I'm particularly grateful to Amanda and Peter for uh, handling the technical fallout from that, which involved <laughs> rewriting the talk on Amtrak and then emailing it to them uh, <laughs> and uh, mounting it on the, on the, on the PowerPoint uh, this evening. Um, because uh, what I want to talk about today in, uh, is the relationship between these two dates, 9-11 and 9-15. Um, and 
And I mean that quite seriously. It's not just a sort of sentimental hook, uh, though the mood in New York is really remarkably somber today and strikingly different, I have to say, from DC. Um, but um, it's actually a quite central set of questions uh, in uh, Crashed, um, as I hope you'll see. Um, because one of the purposes of the book really was to uh, engender a dialogue uh, across the Atlantic between Europe and the United States about what this crisis of 2008 actually meant. And if in 2013, when I started writing the book, it seemed urgent to engender this dialogue about 2008 as a transatlantic event, in our current moment, it seems even more urgent than ever, uh, given the depth of uh, divide that divides at least at the level of the prevailing executive um, uh, Europe and the United States at this moment. So uh, it, though it's a, an occasional a kind of uh, a spur of the moment decision, it actually causes me to highlight some key strands in this book which are essential to its, its basic purpose. And the argument's going to be, broadly speaking, that that divide between Europe and the United States in the interpretation of the world's situation uh, really originates in 9-11 uh, and its aftermath and the way in which that was handled by the Republican administration of the day. And that that has some quite significant consequences for the politics of the financial crisis of 08. Um, but let's start with the economics. 9-11 uh, coming on the back of the dot-com bubble was a very severe shock to the US economy to invest the confidence. Wall Street actually stopped working. Many of the instruments of financial crisis fighting that were put to use in 2008 were in fact first deployed in the days and the hours after 9-11. Uh, the dot-com bust in and of itself is a major shock to the US economy. It's worth talking about mm. perhaps in Q&A why it doesn't have the consequence of a financial crisis. Uh, that 08 did, but the first round of losses uh, to American investors from the bursting of the dot-com bubble, once you adjust them to 2008-09 prices, are more severe than the first round of losses in the real estate crisis. So this is a huge shock to people's portfolios, to people's balance sheets, and it engenders a major recession or the risk of a major recession. And it engenders, consequently, also a very, very significant policy response from the US authorities. Uh, one element of that is the fiscal shift. This has many reasons, of course, uh, amongst them uh, the war on terror and the mounting costs of the campaign in Afghanistan and Iraq and the Republican tax cuts uh, of those years. Uh, if you add them up, you get this kind of uh, analysis. Uh, the, na the analysis itself, the breaking down of the American deficit and what part of it is attributable to which bit of Republican policy and then you can see here the financial crisis from 2007-8 onwards becomes an entire genre of politicized analysis of the American fiscal situation, uh, pushed, of course, largely from the Democratic side of the American spectrum. But the, uh, the analysis is, broadly speaking, uh, important and telling. A huge deficit is run up, which is stabilizing to the U.S. economy in the wake of this double shock of dot-com and 9-11. There is also, of course, a very, very dramatic monetary policy reaction. Greenspan begins dipping interest rates immediately the dot-com bubble bursts and then pushes them down extraordinarily dramatically uh, in the wake of 9-11. Not quite to zero, but if there is a, if you like, a precedent for the kind of close to zero interest rate policy that Ben Bernanke pursues in response to the crisis, it comes in this phase uh, triggered by Greenspan. But more fundamentally, of course, America is from this moment onwards a country in a state of war, or something like a state of war, uh, again, today in New York, the streets are absolutely full of uniformed people wherever you go. Uh, Penn Station today was just awash uh, with uh, uniformed security. I think there were six different dogs on the Amtrak train today sniffing for bombs. Um, maybe that's an exaggeration. Maybe the same ones back and forth, but there were a lot of canines. Um, and it triggers a profound rift uh, within transatlantic politics. Uh, uh, anyone who was in Europe at the time, uh, even in a country like the UK, which of course joins the coalition of the willing, um, uh, was part uh, of a polarization of transatlantic politics that left you really with no choice but to be on one side or the other. The largest demonstrations in the history of the United Kingdom took place in the February of 2003, and the same was true in Spain, in Italy, in France, in Germany as well. So a massive polarization of transatlantic politics is triggered. And not just transatlantic politics, but intellectual discourse as well. Uh, some of you may remember Bob Kagan's deathless intervention uh, in which uh, he was declaring that the Americans are from Mars and the Europeans are from Venus. 
So history hadn't quite ended. It had just sort of partitioned into two rather different versions of history. But there was, of course, also a response from the European side. The unlikely pairing of Jacques Derrida and Jürgen Habermas uh, rode out in 2003 to pitch a kind of almost metaphysical account of Western history and how it divided on the basis of the Iraq war and the responses of both sides. And this isn't just politics or philosophy. The implication was that America and Britain were somehow different, and this clearly had something to do with their political economy as well, though the precise details of this were not spelled out. Um, but I think it begins to color a discourse of a transatlantic cultural and political divide, which has really quite serious long-run implications. It's not by accident that it's the uh, British Foreign Secretary Robin Cook, who resigns in protest over the Iraq war that dubbed America uh, the, the land of feral capitalism, feral capitalism. But within the United States, of course, itself, uh, an increasing anxiety and discontent begins to emerge in response to the uh, uh, increasingly obvious fiasco of uh, the policy in Afghanistan and Iraq. And what this does, I would argue, is to help to shape a macroeconomic critique of the political economy, the geopolitics, the geoeconomics, if you like, of the Bush administration. And this is very powerful and it's very influential. And these are people who are, in fact, predicting a crisis, uh, but they're predicting the wrong crisis. But nevertheless, the influence of this group of Democratic critics, Democratic Party aligned, Clintonites, Rubenites, to be more specific, veterans largely of Robert Rubin's treasury in the 1990s, are extremely influential. And their vision of the mounting tensions within American society in the early 2000s centers on the twin deficit. So it centers on that same graph of the mounting government deficit, which spills over into a mounting trade deficit because the aggregate demand is running too hot. It, spell, it runs over into a deficit, the most important of which, of course, is the deficit with China. The exacerbated, tension-ridden politics of U.S.-China trade are not novel to the Trump administration. They go back to the early 2000s. Um, this is the moment when it arises from the point of view of the Democrats. This is a function of the misguided geopolitics of the Bush administration and its irresponsible fiscal policy. Uh, and that then leads to this huge buildup of China's holdings of U.S. treasuries. Um, so you can see the kind of diagnosis here, this uh, underfunded war, this huge expense of money, may have been macroeconomically appropriate in response to the shocks of the early 2000s, but is basically pushing America into an unsustainable dependence uh, for funding on its major future geopolitical antagonist, China. All of this is already apparent in the early 2000s and becomes the object of a rather uh, 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 obsessive, I might almost say, discourse. Uh, this, uh, a fantastic cartoon rendition of Larry Summers' term, uh, the balance of terror. I think that's a term he coins first at a talk in D.C. at the Peterson Institute in 2003. This idea that the financial relationship between the United States and China is in some sense analogous to the mutually assured destruction kind of relationship of the Cold war, with one element being uh, America's dependent on chi dependence on China's funding of its debt, and on the other hand, China's dependence on America's markets for its export, supposedly export-led uh, economic, economic miracle. The, the crisis scenario that unfolds out of this diagnosis, um, uh, sorry, the, the, the question that arises out of this, uh, from the point of view of the Democrats, is the same question, if you like, the Democrats face today. What on earth is going on inside the GOP? Um, and the, 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 the quote on which this centers um, is, this, is this infamous, probably apocryphal, but nevertheless sort of telling quote from Dick Cheney, which circulates around Amer Washington policymaking circles from 2003 onwards, in which um, uh, Cheney is alleged to have said to the then Treasury Secretary Snow, you know, Paul Reagan proved that deficits don't matter. We won the midterm elections. This is our due. In other words, what the Democrats begin to realize they might be facing is a political economy in which one side takes responsibility for fixing the deficit and the other side takes responsibility for running it up. Um, this uh, uh, hauntingly contemporary uh, diagnosis of the situation from, the, from Brad DeLong, a former member of the, of the Clinton Treasury, I believe, um, uh, re reflecting from the point of view of 2006 in the wake of the Democratic Party victory uh, in, in the congressional uh, midterms, Rubin and us spear carriers moved heaven and earth to restore fiscal balance to the American government, but what we turned out to have done was to enable George W. Bush's right-wing class war, his push for greater after-tax income and quality. And then further on, on fiscal responsibility, it takes two to tangle, and in so tango, and insofar as the GOP doesn't want to dance, Democrats can't afford to take sole responsibility. And this, for me, the absolutely killer line 
surplus creating fiscal policies established by Robert Rubin and company would have been very good for America had Clinton administration been followed by a normal successor. But what is the right fiscal policy for a future Democratic administration to follow when there's no guarantee that any Republican successor will ever be normal again? That's 2006. So coming out of this situation of the early 2000s, directly tied up to the response of the Republican administration to the crisis of 9-11, you get a diagnosis on the part of the Democrats that's hauntingly reminiscent, I think, of our situation 12 years later. Uh, the question, of course, for centrist Democrats like uh, DeLong associated with Rubin is, if this is the position, how on earth do we discipline the left wing of the Democratic Party? Because why on earth should they play responsible fiscal ball when the Republicans aren't? So the risk here is, as it were, containing a breakaway both on the left of the Democratic Party and the right of the Republicans. The crisis scenario that, uh, that they see building up uh, as a result of this lopsided, twisted political economy is the idea of a panic-driven collapse in the dollar. Um, the idea is that at some point uh, we'll reach what Paul Krugman dubs the Wiley E. Coyote moment. People, international investors will realize there is nothing holding the dollar up except their own buying of the dollar and the American assets. At some point they will realize this is an unsustainable situation and then foreign investors will sell off. They'll sell off American bonds so prices will fall and yields will shoot up. The interest rate will surge and at the same time the dollar will plunge. It will be a catastrophe. Well, there are two different versions of this. Uh, uh, Robert Rubin and Peter Orshark, later uh, Obama's budget, budget director, conjure up a kind of Weimar scenario. I think this is largely for the purposes of, dem of disciplining the Democratic Party left. Paul Krugman is more cold-blooded and says, you know what, there are things that will be worse for the American economy than a massive devaluation of the dollar. Uh, it would actually be rather good for exports, but then he goes on to say, this will be rough sledding, this won't be fun, whatever happens. That kind of a surge in interest rates is pretty tough for any economy to take. But this, at least, is the scenario that everyone in this kind of bubble of macroeconomic, political, geopolitical diagnosis, this is the scenario that they're anticipating in 2007-8. It's a very compelling, very dramatic uh, scenario. I've spelled out the politics of it in part so as to convey to you how compelling it is for people who come from a particular political vantage point. The only problem with it is it's not what happened. Um, it is absolutely not what happened because the Chinese actually hold steady. Uh, they flip one type of investment to another. And the dollar, in fact, increases in value against foreign currencies over the course of the crisis in 2008. It turns out that what is going to blindside us in 2007-8 is not this hyper-politicized drama of public balance sheets, of government debt, of the interrelationship between China and the United States. What's going to blindside us is simply the meltdown of financial capitalism in its core between the United States and Europe precisely in the depoliticized realm of market transactions where everything is really basically supposed to have been taken care of by means of derivatives. Those risks are going to be hedged that way. In the Chinese-American scenario, we know we have to do peak diplomacy. Hank Paulson is an old China hand. That's why he's Treasury Secretary, to manage the relationship with China. Um, that relationship actually prov proves to be reasonably solid. What doesn't is the global banking system. And it's the banking system centered on the United States and Europe which is melting down and results uh, by September 2008, 10 years ago, in Ben Bernanke, a sober-sided academic, if there ever was one, uh, going to Congress uh, as Fed chair and uttering these uh, immortal lines. Um, if we don't do this, in other words, TARP, we may, have, we may not have an economy on Monday. We literally may face the extinction of economic activity as we know it. Um, and furthermore, as an economic historian, Ben Bernanke announcing that this is the worst financial crisis in global history, including the Great Depression. It's worth really lingering on that. What Ben Bernanke is saying, and I think he's fundamentally right, is that this is the worst crisis that financial capitalism, since its inception in the early modern period, has ever faced. Now, we don't actually, in the end, suffer the meltdown, so perhaps in terms of historical analogies, the best analogy is something like the Cuban Missile Crisis. We saw the brink, we saw over the brink, we saw how the end of the world would unfold, and then pulled back. But you're never really quite the same again, having uh, lived through that kind of experience. What was it that was melting down? Well, what was melting down, uh, and it's important, I think, to be specific about this, is not so much financial, financial markets per se, 
but the actors in those markets, and specifically the big banks. This cluster of banks on both sides of the Atlantic, which had grown up in the internationalized financial markets uh, that are synonymous with the idea of the euro dollar, offshore, unregulated, uh, private to private, borrowing and lending, outside the regulation of national governments, centered on the relationship between Wall Street and the City of London since the 1950s, with, as you can see, given the balance sheets uh, here, uh, outliers in Paris, in Frankfurt, uh, in uh, Madrid. The numbers are worth looking at, if you can see them, uh, 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 to, to highlight uh, another key point, which is this is certainly an American drama, but the balance sheets of the American banks are by no means exceptional by global standards, and in relation to the national economy that they sit within, in fact, quite modest. Um, if you look at the European banks, Barclays, for instance, or BNP Paribas, or H, uh, HSBC, uh, Royal, the Royal Bank of Scotland, RBS, or UBS in tiny Switzerland. These are much bigger entities in relation to uh, their, their national economies. Why? Because these are global players situated in modestly sized European states, as opposed to American banks, which may have global activity, but whose the vast majority of their work is done in the hinterland, the great hinterland of the US economy. So this is a global story, uh, centrally uh, involving this transatlantic connection of very, very large uh, banks whose balance sheets are profoundly intertwined tangled with each other. The main driver of this story um, are fixed income, are the fixed income markets. So in contemporary, in, in popular commentary on financial markets, there is a horribly uh, a distorting, or I think it's fair to say almost ideologically driven focus on stock markets. So markets, equities in companies, companies that have a kind of or make obvious sense to us because we buy their products. There really is no limit to how much Americans will talk about Tesla or Apple or uh, uh, Microsoft or Google. There's a sort of, it's like sports teams or something. Um, and, uh, but in terms of the functioning of global kind of, uh, financial markets and financial and innovation, uh, the equity market is not where you start. Why? Because they're lumpy precisely for the reason that they're good to talk about. They're really bad to do financial engineering on because they're all so different from each other. Whereas if what you want to do is financial engineering, you want them to be subject to statistical regularity. And for that, you need something far more uniform, something homogenous, something that you can actually do math on. And uh, fixed income securities are much better for that kind of financial engineering. And so uh, this is the backdrop against which the famous securitizations of mortgages take place. Because what that allows you to do is to suck a whole new class of debt into this uh, a model of uh, financial innovation centered on fixed income, uh, not equities. The, and this brings us back to 9-11, because by the late 1990s, uh, all of the pieces of the modern securitization mechanism were in place. The techniques developed by Fannie Mae and its assistant investment banks in Wall Street from the 1970s onwards were, were well tested and tried and ready to go. And what you need to make money in a market like this is some kind of shock to allow difference of expectations to build up so that you can trade on the difference between the two. And that shock came in the early 2000s uh, with uh, Greenspan's decision to lower interest rates to very, very low levels. The macroeconomic consequence of that, given America's mortgage system, is you get a huge churn of refinancing. Households shift from higher interest to lower interest mortgages. You shift purchasing power to people with a higher propensity to consume. And the American economy lurches forward as houses, uh, households unburden themselves from expensive mortgages and shift into uh, lower cost mortgages. And you can see that effect here in this huge surge of mortgage refinancing uh, in this period here. This is a vast amount of business. Look, the mortgage industry surges from 1.3, 1.1 trillion to 3.8 trillion dollars worth of business as Greenspan's interest rate cut in the wake of 9-11 and dot-com kicks in. Within that huge amount, that huge surge, that uh, uh, 2.5 uh, trillion dollar hop between 2000 and 2002, there is also an extremely telling shift in the uh, actors involved. In the first instance, when we're in the first phase of refinancing, it's driven by the old faithfuls, the GSEs, the government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, because these are regular mortgages being refinanced to lower rates by people with standard conforming mortgages. But as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, 
uh, exhaust their potential to do this and then run into some very serious regulatory trouble because if you're doing this kind of volume of business, it's almost guaranteed that something's going to go wrong and things do go wrong. They are then subject to congressional mandates to shrink their balance sheets and into the space left by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac surge the private mortgage providers who focus above all on the lucrative subprime lending which generates much bigger profits for the securitization chain. So you can see this surge that follows the interest rate cut of the early 2000s. First everyone's involved, then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the light blue bar shrink down and it's the bright ultramarine bar that takes over. Those are the private label providers. These are the ones that are going to go bad. This is where the danger is in the system. What Greenspan, I think, didn't understand famously, he's you know, sort of rather naively said, I didn't really understand how greedy everyone was. Uh, for a man of the financial markets, it's a staggering admission. Uh, if one were to put that more technically, I think what he didn't, and no one at the time understood, was that a macroeconomic policy of changing the interest rate could have structural effects in changing the way in which the financial sector operated. And that's what you see uh, here. This is what we now call the realm of macroprudential regulation. How does macro policy affect the way in which the financial sector operates as an industry. We're super sensitive to that, or we would be if we were in the business of rational economic policy. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's really telling about this is that this is not an all-American story. This is a theme I'm harping on, um, uh, and it's important to just get the scale of this, of this clear. So here is the surge in private label securitization. The graph now is familiar. It's the same surge, right? It's this light blue bit here. It's it's this uh, chunk of the securitization business. And who's doing it? Well, the interesting thing is that as the market surges towards its peak, more and more of the subprime privatization in the United States is being driven by non-American actors, by Europeans. By the final stages of the boom, more than a third of the most dangerous private securitization is ending up on the balance sheets of European banks. Why? Because we're in a globalized world, we've been saying this for 30 or 40 years, it's driven by private corporations doing their thing, we've been saying that for all this time too, none of this should be a surprise, um, but they really do do it, and they go hunting that yield anywhere they can get it, and Deutsche Bank establishes a pipeline that goes all the way from the African-American deprived suburbs of Cleveland all the way up to its central office in Frankfurt and Wall Street, and subprime securitization becomes a huge part of its business model and that of UBS and many other key uh, European actors too. They're not just doing that by all anymore in the United States. European finance is doing that everywhere. It's doing it on the other side of the Atlantic too. This is the boom in credit within the Eurozone. And if you followed Eurozone politics, you'd imagine that this was the public debt burden and that was the private bit. Because as we know, of course, it's evidently true that the Eurozone doesn't have fiscal rules and so bad democratic politicians piled up huge amounts of sovereign debt because they could all borrow at the same prices as Germany. Just not true. This is the public sector part of the Eurozone debt, which you can see is broadly speaking dead, flatlining, no one's borrowing very much, uh, but the private sector is. It's a story quite analogous to the United States. Uh, I'm doing it on a huge scale, and the consequence of that is that here's America's housing bubble, and there's the housing bubble of Spain and Ireland. Right? So this is the credit expansion relative to GDP, and this is the house price change relative to GDP. That's the American bubble that's so famous that we think of as being the center of the drama, Here's the Spanish and the Irish one, out by an order of magnitude larger and more dangerous, driven by the same actors operating on both sides. And again, we shouldn't resort to national character, character, you know, national stereotypes. When we talk about European banks, where do European banks get their funding from? A large part of their funding comes from American money market mutual funds because they will offer you slightly higher yields than American banks will. Why? Because they're putting it into Spain and Ireland, which are having absolutely astonishing housing booms. So you can make even more money there. This is a thoroughly networked. Uh, crisis that is rippling through both sides of the North Atlantic economy. Uh, it's not quite how we imagine globalization, because when we think globalization, we think China, and that's where the minds of the American policymaking community was. But in fact, this is kind of like an early modern North Atlantic bubble. This is a familiar scenario all the way back to the 18th century. North Atlantic finance operating on both sides in a single, as a single unit. If you came down from space, if you were from Mars and you looked at the data of the BIS, if that was the first thing you did on Earth, was to look at the data of the Basel uh, Bank of International Settlements, you know, a nerdy Martian comes down. And what I really want to know is how your financial system is wired. Um, if you didn't have any prejudices about how the world was organized, in other words, 
this is what you would see. This is the world banking economy in 2007. And if you just were starting from scratch, you'd simply have to conceive the entire thing centers on Europe. It certainly doesn't center on the United States Asian axis, which is the center of the American, that drama that the Clintonian Rubenites have sort of fashioned for themselves. It's all about this interrelationship here, which is boring, post-historic. You know, what could be more tedious for American policymakers than the EU? Um, uh, it's, it's supposed to be regulated by private contracts, derivatives that, se that securitize and stabilize this, but this is what's going to blow up. Um, but nevertheless, European policymakers are, perhaps not surprisingly, only too happy to hand the financial crisis to the Americans. This is your problem, your currency, your economy, your melting down, and in an astonishing unanimity across Europe, in 2008, we have a kind of reverb of the reaction of 2003. You know what? This is a crisis made in America. We told you so. So here's uh, Per Steinbrück, uh, Germany's uh, finance minister of the day. This is the, the, the crisis is the result of America's laissez-faire ideology as practiced during the subprime crisis. It was simplistic and it was dangerous and it would bring about the end of America as a financial superpower. Sarkozy uh, was giving speech after speech in this period announcing the end of dollar hegemony. We were out from underneath, finally this would be the end of that. Uh, Tremonti, Berlusconi's finance minister, he had the best one-liner. Um, Italy's banks were fine because they didn't speak English. So <laughs> as long as you weren't part of that ghastly Anglosphere, you were going to be just fine. Uh, uh, Medvedev, actually, then serving as Russian's president, I think articulated uh, in characteristically frank ways, the, the, both the force of this idea and its problems. He says, you know what, the financial crisis and our current troubles with the Americans over Georgia, remember this is also the anniversary, uh, August, September 2008, of the first shooting war between Russia and a Western proxy uh, in Georgia in 2008. He goes to the Russian parliament on his way to the G20, on his way to the United Nations, in fact, by way of France, and he's warming up his pitch. And his pitch is, you know what, you might not think that the Georgian crisis and the financial crisis have got much to do with each other, but they in fact do. Their common denominator is American unilateralism. Uh, and if you look at the opinion polls of 2008-9, uh, this is the nadir of the popularity of the Bush administration. Uh, the crisis is seen as a result largely of a kind of maladministration, a badly administered American state. The irony, of course, is, as Bernanke is saying, uh, that this is actually not an American drama, and we should focus on his words. It was the worst financial crisis in global history. So, of course, you have the American casualties on one side of the ledger, but then here are the, Amer the Europeans uh, to match. Dexia, Fortis in Benelux, France, Northern Rock, Alliance and Leicester, RBS, HBOS in Britain, all being brought down simply by the deflation of that European bubble. Hupo Real Estate, the Landers Banking across Germany, uh, UBS uh, in Switzerland, and so on and so forth. Ireland's entire banking system, Iceland, South Korea, and the Russian banking system all sucked into this crisis. So the question, as it were, rather the, the point I'm trying to make, is that a politically bifurcated reading is being imposed on something which is thoroughly interconnected, intertangled, uh, and inextricably uh, intertwined. Why? Because this is the state of the global financial economy at this moment. This, to my mind, is the single scariest graph produced by the crisis. These are gross capital flows, so flows back and forth across borders, both before and after the crisis. And you can see, even at a distance, the huge collapse we're talking about. The global financial economy flatlines in 2008-9. I'm asked again and again and again in radio interviews, so, you know, Professor Tews, when's the crisis happening again? And the answer is, that's a bit like asking, so when are you going to have your next massive heart attack? Um, hopefully never, because as Bernanke said, this is the worst we've ever experienced, and it's this kind of an event. It's not the flu. It's not the dot-com bubble bursting. This is terminal from the point of view of the global banking system, unless somebody acts. And no one escapes, right? So the top lighter bars here are the emerging markets and the oil exporters. That's what the drama in the minds of the dollar crash scenario is. The Chinese sell off and we're done for. In fact, we're done for because this bit collapses, and that's global money flowing back and forth between the advanced economies. That's essentially the European-American axis, which implodes. Um, and it implodes with absolutely massive effect. You can tell how comprehensive it is by looking at how people have to respond. The 
the testimony, the evidence of the facts is extremely dramatic in this case. So these are funds committed to the bailout effort uh, in uh, the wake of the crisis. Uh, the numbers are small, uh, but they're very big if you get them close up. Uh, we're talking about the commitment of about $6 trillion to various types of recapitalization and guarantee effort. It is the single largest stabilization effort ever mounted in the history of modern government. Full stop, at any time. Nothing like this has ever been done. The only thing close to it would be wartime mobilization efforts. And as you can see, it involves almost all of the uh, rich countries of the world, all of the members of the OECD. And as a share of GDP, um, the United States effort, which we'll use as a benchmark down here, is only 30% of US GDP, as big as TARP and all the other measures were. It's only 30%. And as soon as you get to Europe, the numbers shoot up. 50% of Dutch GDP had to be mobilized. 47% of Belgium, because they had such a large transnational sector. Uh, the, uh, the United Kingdom coming in at 50% as well, because of the gigantic crisis uh, in uh, the UK banking system. But the reality is that this was the national response. This was the national response to the crisis of 08. Uh, this cannot, in fact, address the most dangerous element of the crisis, which is the cross-border transnational element. Those are the flows which are contracting most savagely. And so you can, in fact, there's, and, and there's only one agency that can respond. There's no international agency. The IMF isn't even remotely large enough to deal with these kind of bank balance sheets. Six trillion dollars is not something in which the IMF works. The IMF is a mid-century, mid-20th century agency which does programs numbered in the 10, 20, 30, 40 billion range, not six trillion. Um, the only agency that can provide a global backstop uh, is the United States Federal Reserve, because it has a limitless capacity to produce dollars. So you can see in the balance sheets of the Federal Reserve, thanks to a freedom of information suit fought by Bloomberg, contested all the way up to the Supreme Court, which they finally won, we can see in the balance sheets of the Federal Reserve of the United States the entire global financial system quaking. Um, because what the Fed did was to provide liquidity to every single major bank in the world that had an office and a headquarters in Wall Street. And here you can see the numbers. So here are the big American banks at the top, and they're receiving, you know, across the group, across the across the range. So Citigroup about 500 500 billion dollars uh, in liquidity support. This is ready cash in which the Fed will take some long dated asset and exchange it for ready cash. Uh, and then if you go down the bottom here, strikingly, all of the major European banks receiving about half a trillion each. That seems to have been the, the approximate ration. Now, half a trillion dollars, in terms of the churn of global financial markets, may not be very large. So the repo market, for instance, churns about $5 trillion a day. But against the balance sheet of a bank, which might be $2 trillion, $500 billion in liquidity provided by the Fed on, a, on call is a huge uh, uh, backstop uh, uh, reserve, reserve support. And the Fed, of all of the liquidity lending that it does, these are not bailouts, these are not asset purchases, this is lender of last resort, provision of cash to banks in exchange for illiquid assets. Of the support that it provides to big banks, more than half is going to non-American banks. So the United States is acting de facto as a provider of lender of last resort to the entire uh, global uh, banking system. And when that was not enough, what the Fed did in 2008 was to engage in little contracts like this. They always look to me like sort of standardized rental contracts like my graduate students signed with Columbia University. Um, but what these provided for was swap line facilities under which the Fed would pump liquidity not into the private banks of Europe, but into their central banks. Um, so it would exchange euros for dollars, um, initially in the tens of billions, hundreds of billions. By September, 650 billion was the overdraft cap for global central banks. And from the 13th of October 2008, it was unlimited. So the ECB, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, Swiss National Bank had the unlimited right to credit the Fed with their national currency and in exchange receive dollars at an agreed exchange rate uh, with a small uh, interest premium for the Fed. And the consequence of that is an explosion in Fed lending to the central banks of the world uh, from, the fall of 2000 and from the fall of 2008 onwards. Uh, by uh, December 2008, as Ben Bernanke somewhat sheepishly admits uh, in his memoirs, uh, it constituted the largest single item in the central bank uh, balance sheet. Here are the totals. 
uh, over the course of the crisis, uh, the Fed provided the ECB with $2.5 trillion, the Bank of Japan with $727 billion. The numbers are staggering. In relation to the global churn of the financial markets, again, these are actually reasonable, reasonably proportioned numbers. And what they're doing is breaking the spikes in difficulty in financing when the ECB is finding it extremely expensive to get dollars they can flip into Fed funding so the European banking system never ever runs short. Now the extraordinary thing about this is not only the scale but to my mind uh, the other remarkable thing about it is how totally unheralded it is. So this is the largest single act of transnational, transatlantic financial policy conducted probably since the days of the Marshall Plan. But this book that I've just published is the first to place it at the heart of its narrative. It's not absolutely the first to discuss it. There are some technical political science discussions and IR discussions of it. This story lingers around the edge of the memoirs of Bernanke, uh, Paulson, and so on. But none of these narratives center the transatlantic dimension as the heart of the financial stabilization effort, even though without this support, um, the uh, European banking system would just flat out have failed or would have been forced into a ruinous sale of its American assets, destabilizing the US economy. So the question for me that haunts this is what is the state of transatlantic relations at that moment that makes this so difficult to articulate? And that's a question actually I'll just leave uh, for discussion afterwards. But it seems to me to bear the hallmarks of the sort of situation that we've been in since the end of the Cold War, where neither side is really altogether comfortable with the relationship that we've been in. The need is not evident anymore. The threat from the outside doesn't appear so clear. And yet, at moments of emergency like this, the centrality of the United States to the global financial system is evident, and you can read it off these numbers. And yet, neither side, neither the Americans nor the Europeans, have any incentive to celebrate this or even just document it publicly as a sign of their entanglement. I want to turn in the final part of the talk to another dimension of this uh, crisis and the crisis response, which to my mind also harkens back uh, to the legacies uh, of 9-11. Obviously, the answer I'm suggesting to the question I've just posed is that there's something about the divided, polarized, acrimonious state of European-American relations uh, in 2008-9 that make this difficult to articulate. Uh, to me, it's in some ways analogous to the NSA drama, in which the Europeans finally woke up to the fact that they were being spied on by American spies and then woke up to the fact that their own secret agencies knew that they were being spied on by American spies. In fact, everyone in the know knew that they were being spied on, in large part because the Europeans don't have the capacity to do their own spying, so they engage in various types of sharing with the Americans. But no one wants to talk about this on either side of the Atlantic if they can possibly avoid it, despite the fact that they consider it, for security policy purposes, essential to do this. And the financial relationships we're talking about here seem to me to fit in sort of in the same kind of category. Everyone who was in the know knew that this was going on and powerfully and essentially stabilizing for the transatlantic financial economy. No one wanted to articulate it as an explicit political statement. But let me, let me, come, to, let me come to the final uh, element of, of the talk. Um, the question that Europeans often ask themselves about American crisis fighting is why it was as energetic as it was. Because what I've just described to you is very energetic uh, uh, interventionist activity from the United States, a, a willing embrace of discretionary power of the state to stabilize the financial crisis. And one of the things that's extremely, extremely striking when you read the rhetoric, the political language of the crisis fighters on the two sides of the Atlantic is one very striking difference, and it goes back to the point that I was emphasizing earlier on, which is that American policymakers think of their reaction to the financial crisis as first responders, uh, as a, in military terms, as a national security strategy, as a response to a national crisis that demands unfettered, uh, discretionary and determined action by the American, the American state. And the metaphors for this are explicitly uh, military. And this is a rhetoric which is largely absent uh, from the European side. It's not a lexicon that Europeans can access in the way that American policymakers can. And if you go back uh, into American history, um, what's really striking is that this doesn't start with 2001 or with 2008. 
If you look at Larry Summers, for instance, a key figure behind the scenes in shaping this generation of crisis fighters, the junior figure in the famous Executive Committee to Save the World of the 1990s, Larry Summers here, Greenspan and Rubin in the background. Summers actually recalls in the 1980s thinking, as he described it uh, to a journalist, that America needed something like economic statescraft. It needed to be something between Henry Kissinger and Martin Feldstein, the great inspirer of a whole generation of policy wonks uh, up in Massachusetts. It needed to be between geopolitics and negotiations and the regressions and models. And the language that they draw on um, is that of the American military in the post-Vietnam period of reconstruction and rehabilitation. And the anchoring figure for this, uh, obvious from the security policy narrative, is Colin Powell. So you will see policymaker after policymaker in America invoking the so-called Powell Doctrine of financial crisis fighting. And this is the Baudelaire's Clausewitzian uh, economic thinking of the American military in the 70s and 80s. And it's maximum force. It's that Napoleon maxim of applying the maximum force, the Napoleonic maxim of applying the maximum force to the decisive point. This is the kind of mantra of American crisis fighting from the 1990s onwards. A massive show of financial force. Geithner will repeatedly invoke the Powell Doctrine of crisis fighting to bewildered European audiences in 2008-9, as though Colin Powell's name for European audiences after his appearance at the UN in 2003 wasn't mud. But from the point of view of this generation of, Euro of American policymakers, it remains a gold standard of a kind of understanding of how military power, America's power, can actually be thrown into the balance and count, and not, as it were, descend into the quagmire of Vietnam. What's astonishing is, is that this is across the parties. So this is Stiglitz in 2010 saying, as the United States entered the first Gulf War, Colin Powell articulated what became known as the Powell Doctrine, one element of which included attacking with decisive force. There should be something analogous in economics, perhaps the Krugman-Stiglitz Doctrine, when an economy as weak, very weak as the world economy appeared in 2009, attack with overwhelming force. Now, there is no part of the European spectrum that can access this kind of rhetoric. Um, certainly not the left of center people. But you can see the vernacular way in which this notion of executive power, military power, morphs from one zone to the other. Um, and when you get to Tim Geithner in 2008-9, if you've read his biography, you'll know the entire book is saturated. Uh, with this self-consciousness of Geithner as a figure analogous to the crisis fighters, the first responders, the men who run into the falling building, who place themselves on the line. This is, this, this is the most sort of uh, glaring element of it. He literally makes an analogy between his experience of fighting Lehman and the film Hurt Locker, which is about a team in Iraq defusing improvised explosive devices. Uh, look at it, the Oscar-winning film. What we went through uh, in interminable conference calls in fancy office buildings obviously did not compare, obviously, to the horrors of war. But ten minutes into the movie, I knew I'd finally found something that captured what the crisis felt like. Right? The overwhelming burden of responsibility combined with the paralyzing risk of catas catastrophe. The frustration about the stuff out of your control. The uncertainty about what would help. The knowledge that even good decisions might turn out badly. And then, of course, the sentimental coda, the pain and guilt of neglecting your family, the loneliness and the numbness. And I don't mean sentimental in a critical way. This is just the register of, uh, of, in which this generation of American policymakers spontaneously translate their experience of fighting this crisis. It is the register of America post 9-11. Uh, the identification with America's heroes uh, is, uh, so, is so palpable here. Um, this, of course, is not without risks. I mean, first of all, the obvious and transparent function of this kind of rhetoric is to shut down any talk about what you're doing. Because you're really not going to, you know, if somebody's defusing a bomb, and if that, what, that's what Geithner is doing in the financial crisis, it's really not okay to distract him with questions about whether he's defusing the right bomb <laughs> or whether it might kill people on this side rather than that side, because what we've got to do is focus on not exploding the bomb, right? So it has an, it's a moral blackmail, which is very powerful, um, but it's also potentially explosive uh, in its implications. And a, and a European commentator, not surprisingly Willem Boiter, the really vituperative, fantastically vituperative Dutch economist, uh, laid this out right in response to uh, the TARP bill, in response to the demand by Hank Paulson to have the complete license to spend hundreds of billions of dollars any way he liked without judicial review. Boiter wrote, 
It, it was as though Paulson's bill was written personally by Dick Cheney, the prince of absolute executive authority, no checks and balances, no accountability, no recourse, no administration that brought us WMD in Iraq and the torture camps of Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib should expect anything but hysterical giggles in response to such a request. And TARP was turned down on the 29th of September 2008 to the shock and horror uh, of markets all over the world. Uh, here, <coughs> a Californian Democrat, we've all been told repeatedly by this administration the economy is fundamentally sound, and now all of a sudden it isn't. They're trying to scare us, uh, as they did over Iraq, into pre precipitate action, uh, and we know the kind of uh, fear-mongering that was used. So it tempts, it's compelling in its own right, it has an extraordinary emotional logic, uh, but it's politically risky. And it isn't, in the end, left of centre people like Boiter, uh, and Stark that matter, it's the response within the Republican Party itself. Because the Republican Party doesn't buy it. This is the really astonishing thing about the bailouts of 2008, and the point I will leave you with as the, as the conclusion. The astonishing thing about 2008 is the Republican Party will not give its own administration the votes to bail out not just the investment banks, but Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the pillars of American mortgage financing. They cannot whip the votes. Bernard tells Paulson point blank, don't even bother, don't ask me to do this. Go and use the Democrats to get you the bailout that you need. And this is clearly, I think, part of the long-run erosion of the coherence of the GOP as a governing party, in which, of course, the disaster in Iraq is a key element, because by the summer of 2008, they're trying to distance themselves as far as they can from that of a hideous debacle. So it's this coalition of folks like Bernanke and Paulson, middle-of-the-road conservative Republicans uh, with uh, the Democratic congressional leadership that does the deed, at the same time as Sarah Palin is nominated by McCain as his running mate. And uh, Steve Bannon is on the loose, uh, warming up the narrative uh, that will lead us directly, of course, to our current situation. For Steve Bannon, there's absolutely no question that 2008 is the key turning point, and he will make a career over the years that follow in worshipping Sarah Palin and promoting his quite compelling narrative of 2008 as a generational uh, betrayal. Meanwhile, the Bernankes and the Paulsons of this world uh, find themselves, in Bernanke's word, abandoned by their own party. And Paulson, the architect of the bailout of 2016, as mainline of conservatives if you could possibly ask for, devout Christian, Goldman Sachs uh, CEO, uh, environmentalist, the Republican of the new type, finds himself in the summer of 2016 openly advocating the candidacy of Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump uh, on the grounds that he doesn't think that Donald Trump could have handled the crisis uh, of 08. Uh, which is a little fair, unfair, I think, to Donald Trump. We could ask, we could talk more about that in the break afterwards. Um, but this really, I think, is what I want to leave you with, this sense that the crisis uh, of, of 08 um, is, is quite profoundly overshadowed in all these different dimensions by the fault lines uh, created by 2001 to 2003, and how that through a variety of different channels, most importantly in our current moment, the fissures that open up within the GOP, the inability of that party any longer to articulate its base uh, with its elite uh, global leadership aspirations, how that continues to shape our present. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So now we move on to our question period, the basic ground rules. Wait till we call on you. Wait till the microphone reaches you. Please use the microphone uh, and identify yourself before you speak. This gentleman right here. Are we going to take them one by one? Yes. Is that, is that okay? <laughs> totally fine, yeah. All right, then. Good, Dan Lieberman. Just uh, two quick questions. You know, the trade deficit keeps increasing and the national government deficit keeps increasing. Nothing seems to be happening bad, so when is enough enough? And the second question is to the, uh, the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing. Did that really help the economy or just raise the price of financial assets? Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, oh, I speak into the mic. Sorry, I'll speak into the mic. Yeah, I'll lead forward. I, I, I. Um, and, and liberals are always caught, I think, in a cleft, thick, a cleft, cleft stick uh, between our uh, kind of Keynesian impulses to insist that budget deficits are harmless and, in fact, can be rather good for the economy and our desire to beat the Republicans uh, with the stick of fiscal responsibility. Um, 
and and it's not it's not it's not an easy it's not an easy choice. Um, rather than going into the politics of it, let me just focus on the, your your a very correct observation that nothing bad seems to have happened, um, and that I think really is the is the really striking discovery. Dick Cheney may be right, and deficits deficits may not matter. Um, in fact, we need to wonder, I think, and ask historically why it was that a group of Democrats convinced themselves that they did matter and that they should be the totem of responsibility. And I think you have to go back to the state of the bond market in the early 1990s when the incoming Clinton administration was faced with what was interpreted as a very serious risk to the authority of the Clinton administration. Um, this is the moment where you know, people were talking about... Um, uh, the, the, the bond market as a kind of god that could dictate policy even to the United States. And, and that threat has, has evaporated over the course of the last decades to an extraordinary extent. And so we did indeed sail through the financial crisis with far from the bond markets freaking out and people selling treasuries and pushing interest rates up with interest rates collapsing to historically low levels. Um, it's difficult, and right now, given the global configuration, the United States is the only issuer of treasury-type, high-grade, low-risk securities for borrowers all over the world. I mean, what are Germans supposed to do? Sorry, lenders from all over the world. What are German savers supposed to do with their saving? You can't put it into German government bonds because the German government's running a surplus and is committed to doing so forever. So there never are going to be any. So you're, as a German saver, you're either going to have to buy other Eurozone sovereigns or you're going to have to buy American sovereigns. Um, so there is a huge sort of imbalance in the global market which basically enables the United States for the foreseeable future, I think, to ride uh, this, this wave of global demand. Now, there are various scenarios, and people are calculating them right now, under which that demand for American debt could evaporate. Um, but... You're completely right. Right now, there seems to be no limit. And I think the question from the point of view of progressives is why we've never tried what the Trump administration and Republicans are doing right now. I mean, they're going to run the economy as hot as they possibly can. They're going to drain the labor market. And that's the sort of thing that we've repeatedly convinced ourselves we can't do. And this, in fact, even a Marxist Keynesian theorist, uh, Kalecki, who tells you you'll be viciously punished if you do this. Now, it may be that a democratic administration, especially one of a radical hue, would be viciously punished. And it's maybe only Republicans who can do this because markets fundamentally trust them with the interests of American business. You've got a cooperative central bank. Um, it's, it's not easy to see why anyone can't do this. So I, I think, say, in Britain will be an interesting test. The Corbyn administration there would be an interesting test of, of this hypothesis, of the neutrality of bond markets with an aggressive central bank. Coming on to your second question, which I'm taking a long time to answer your first, um, I mean, the, the econometrics on QE are complicated, and I'm not an econometric economist. I can read the econometrics just about and make an informed decision, an informed opinion about it. Uh, there is huge contention about how it works. I think the evidence on the crisis itself, and there may be people in the room who know this stuff much better than me, is that the first round was probably unambiguously powerful in its effects. And after that, we're a little less certain about whether round two and round three really helped. Looking at it from a European point of view, uh, round two and round three certainly allowed the Europeans to reshuffle their balance sheets. So the Europeans pilloried the Americans for doing this program. And in fact, if you look at who's holding the cash that accumulates in the, on the, as the counterpart to the bonds in the balance sheet of the United States Federal Reserve, it's overwhelmingly European banks. So the Europeans are taking, banks are taking advantage of this. It provided a pillow, if you like, therefore, to the global financial system. Its efficacy for the U.S. economy, I think, is in doubt. I think Ben Bernanke himself would always have said that fiscal policy would have been better. The problem is, of course, that from 2010 onwards, Congress is logjammed, and that's really the moment from which fiscal policy as a constructive stimulus force is gone, and America, like Europe, really pushes into a very contractionary stance between 2011 and 2013. Uh, and so QE is pushing against the wind uh, at a, uh, in, in that phase. We have a gentleman right here. Uh, my name is Matthew Fink. I used to run the Mutual Fund uh, Trade Association here. Uh, I want to challenge you about your thesis that the response to 2008 was colored by 9-11. Yeah. I think it was, but I think that syndrome goes deeper and longer in American history. Because yep. remember, it was Grant in the Civil War who developed the doctrine after uh, of hitting the South at the strongest point repeatedly, that yep. whatever yep. Colin Powell's statement was. 
that became American military doctrine. Yeah. And that, that we knew that in World War II when the Americans wanted to invade France as early as 1942 and the British uh, Churchill wanted a peripheral strategy. So we had that difference on military and at least the literature I've read, that spilled over to American, or the same view was held, because there are hundreds of books written on the Great Depression that the Fed slept through the whole thing, yeah, yeah. like Galbraith's The Great Crash. So I think 9-11 proves it, but I think just the latest example of it, and what I don't know, did the Europeans spend the last 40 years complaining that their central banks didn't do enough in the 30s? I'm not aware of that. So I have a feeling this syndrome, which I agree with, is not brand new. That's my comment. I would, I would completely agree. That, that's what I was trying to say. I may not have said it as clearly as I intended. Um, I, I was giving it a shorter history than you have. Uh, I was saying it went back to the post-Vietnam period when I think these lessons were relearned because obviously Vietnam was not the kind of war where you could effectively deploy that kind of logic. Grant was a Bonaparte, was a, was a Napoleon you know, scholar. This was West Point's teaching, was, was, was really, as it was everywhere. You didn't have to read Clausewitz, you got it via Hominy. Um, but 19th century American uh, military thinking was shaped by this. Um, the question really is what opens, which events open the door to this sort of strange segue from economic policy to military thinking? Uh, and I would agree with you that American central bank doctrine is in the wake of the Great Depression fundamentally activist. And this is the lesson that they learned from Friedman and Schwartz's account, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's account of the Great Depression as that famous moment when Ben Bernanke goes to Friedman's 80th birthday and says, Anna and Milton, you were right, we were wrong, and thanks to you, we'll never do it again. In other words, you were right in saying that a contraction of the money supply massively amplified the Great Recession. We will not do that again. And that provides, I completely agree, a kind of activist hook onto which you can then peg all sorts of other things. And so what's interesting to me as a sort of historian is just not necessarily the sort of long structural determination, but what bit from the range of different repertoires the policymakers in 08 pick up. And what's really interesting is that people like Geithner grab onto this and do resuscitate this language, which he may not know anything about Civil War military history, but he does know about Colin Powell. And Colin Powell, of course, is a well-educated American soldier, so he's steeped in it. I completely agree. I the can I just answer your European bit of your question? Because that was a question, I thought. That, I thought, I thought that was, that's very interesting. And, and it's astonishingly different. So you would think that German central bankers would learn, you know, if they were committed to the support of German democracy, they would learn the lesson that deflation is the worst thing ever. Because it wasn't the hyperinflation of 18 to 23 that produced Hitler. He was defeated in the Munich beer hall putsch of 23. He didn't get in on the back of the in hyperinflation. He tried, but failed. What took him to power democratically was the depression, because the depression is a demobilizing thing. A deflationary depression kills the labor movement. It eviscerates the power structures of a society. And inflation doesn't. And inflation shoves up the aggression of class struggle, because you have to defend yourself against other people in a, con in a race. And so you'd think they would learn that a deflation was the absolutely worst thing. But as we know, that isn't the slogan that the, the Bundesbank carries on its forehead, right? It carries anti-inflation on its forehead. And no, I mean, I've tried generations of, you know, Anglophone wonks and their allies in Germany have tried to shift the German mindset on this. But it's, it's, very, it's very deep and very weird. It's not obvious that it should be this way. So as a historian, you say, this is the result of a constructed memory. Apparently, the, the Bundesbank, when Bretton Woods broke up, engaged in a public history exercise to remind everyone of hyperinflation. Yeah. Uh, so, Adam, I'm going to slip in a question here. I mean, this is a, a long and complex book, uh, and there are many, many themes that you couldn't talk, touch on in this talk, and I suspect you have many talks uh, that we would all benefit from listening to. But one of the themes not touched upon today, but that you do go into considerable detail in the book on, are the political ramifications uh, of the story that you tell for electoral politics on several continents. At the end of the book, you make a point about the Democratic Party's inability to capitalize uh, in political terms on what they had accomplished, and they had accomplished a great deal, and you mentioned TARP and the various bailouts and the saving of, of the economy. Earlier in the book, at multiple places, you talk about the vast human suffering mm 
that these approaches did not touch. Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, the pain that some of these policies inflicted upon, I don't know, tens of millions of people, you know, in, in Greece, Spain, Portugal, uh, and the United States, and how that Wall Street but not Main Street uh, approach um, in, to a certain degree kind of underwrote uh, conservative or right-wing demagoguery, uh, pro-Brexit uh, uh, sentiment uh, uh, and the like. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Because it seems to me that in writing a history of the present, mm -hmm. the political dimension is absolutely central. You do deal with it here, and I think we should hear you elaborate a little bit more on that. No, th th thank you. Uh, maybe to make it manageable, I'll just focus on the U.S. Um, because I'm really averse to the generalizing um, populism term. And that's not because I'm averse to generalization. I just think the generalization has to be backed up by mm -hmm. some... So, you know, when we're talking about finance, I'll generalize all day about European American banks because they are actually interconnected with each other in a system which forces them to really behave similarly. But the, but the, the talk, of, you know, the babble about populism... I find, you know, in itself politically contentious. I think that term is what the Germans would call a Kampfbegriff, a fighting term, um, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a cudgel the centre wields against uh, uh, peripheral forces that it, that it's uh, insurgent forces that it's uncomfortable with. Uh, in the U.S. case, I mean, I, I highlighted one of the dynamics, which is the fracturing of the Republican Party, uh, and I really think that's the most evident, most straightforward linkage that, 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 that takes us to our present moment. The Republican Party since the late 60s, early 70s has been pursuing a strategy, um, and it's not, I'm not, you know, they along with all other parties have been pursuing a strategy in which they balance an elite, an elite if you like, set of preoccupations with a strategy for mobilizing their base. And crudely speaking, it's uh, you know, a globalist elite strategy, uh, which gives you things like NAFTA, for instance, uh, or votes for the accession of China to the WTO, uh, which you know, po policymakers like Bob Zulick and so on worked along alongside Democratic counterparts. And on the other hand, a base mobilization strategy, which is the Southern strategy, crudely put. In other words, uh, pilfering uh, formerly uh, Democratic Party voters in the South on the basis of the reflux uh, from civil rights. And, and then elaborating that, and continuously elaborating it um, uh, in the decades since. And that's an incredibly difficult strategy to pull off. I mean, every, all parties pursue some version of you know, a compromise like this, but the Republicans, and it, if one were going to find analogues, the Tory party, the Conservative Party in Britain, has pursued a similarly tense strategy. And when you hit a bump like 2008, that is liable to come apart. And what we saw in the summer of 2008 was that alliance strategy coming apart. The base and their, vo their mouthpieces in the, in the Congress were just simply not going to go along with this big government um, Wall Street bailout. And that opens a huge, a huge gap. How then the mechanics from there on in work? I think, you know, I'm by no means the best person to talk about this kind of thing. Political scientists like, you know, Theda Skopchpal have done a brilliant job at looking at the constituency of the Tea Party. It's not that original a movement. It's not even obvious, in fact, that the Tea Party is necessarily driven by, you know, a kind of... Uh, they're not the downtrodden working class that so commonly invoke. They're, in fact, fairly conventional middle-aged, upper middle-aged men uh, with slightly higher than average incomes expressing extremely nationalist. It's more a kind of support for the big, powerful American military state than anything else. So that story, I don't think, works all that well. What I think does work is the fragmentation of the coalition that Obama was able to assemble, uh, where I think that sense of disappointment is really very palpable. Um, the Obama administration is hailed in its, you know, in its incoming phase as this revolutionary administration, potentially, that's going to change the complexion of American society. And they took, shall we say, a cautious approach to that project. I'm not going to dismiss the, the, the ambition of the administration. And, of course, it centers above all on health care. Health care is the key issue. And they're not wrong, surely, in diagnosing that as the one single thing that American government could actually do for its citizens, especially at the bottom of the pile. That is the single thing that will be easiest to fix. We could think of all sorts of imaginative other things, industrial policy, education, all this kind of stuff to fight globalization. They've been trying that since the 90s. It hadn't worked terribly well. They tried once on health care. They were going to go give it another shot. And having made that commitment... They felt, I think, politically that the window of opportunity was very narrow. The, the opposition in Congress is just, you know, is, 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 is fire-breathing, a partisanship. 
And they're going to burn whatever political capital they have in getting that through, and they do. Um, so the two big initiatives are basically the stimulus, which is very considerable but not big enough, um, and, um, and uh, ACA, um, Obamacare. And then really there isn't that much left for anything else. They're going to just about push Dodd-Frank over the line. Um, but if you listen to people like Larry Summers and take seriously what he's saying, and I, you know, I think he's probably a credible witness on this, they thought about you know, various types of more aggressive and extensive homeowner bailout. Mm -hmm. It was an obvious political call to try, but then when they did the math, both on the economic and the political side, they simply couldn't figure out a way to make it work, and they pulled back away from it. It's not even true that they don't, in the end, legally pursue the banks. I mean, American banks pay bigger fines, or not fines, of course. It's very important to say they're not fines. They're out-of-court settlements. But the settlements are gigantic, you know, are historically unprecedented. Um, but they don't ever take them really to trial, so you don't establish a tradition really of, of judicial decision-making, and instead they just simply transfer tens, in the end, more than hundreds of billions of dollars back to the American taxpayer. Um, but of course it isn't the management that pays the price. There's not a single senior banker that is dragged off to jail, uh, and it's basically the shareholders that eat the, eat the cost. So it's... Uh, it's a very um, partial, and you can see, if you speak to survivor, you know, veterans of the Obama administration, they will now frankly admit to you that there just wasn't enough punishment. I mean, this is a word that a very senior figure of the Obama administration used to me off the record. We should have punished more. Because uh, if this is a broken contract situation, in, and you ask why they didn't, the answer is they were afraid of destabilizing financial markets even more. So they thought they would provoke another Lehman because they interpret Lehman as being an act of punishment, a misguided act, effort to really force punishment on the bankers. They don't want to do that again because it destabilizes markets. But if this is a broken contract situation, the logic of that apparently, according to the psychologists, is that people who feel wronged by a broken contract are willing to take a little bit of extra pain even beyond what they've already suffered to see the perpetrator hurt uh, and that is the logic they simply didn't bite on Thank you. let's move to this side um, yep. Christian, you, the gentleman over there yep. uh, thank you uh, Dave Rabinowitz uh, in 1981 there was a big tax cut for wealthy uh, real estate bubble developed, and seven years later, there was a savings loan crisis. Yeah. In 2001, there was a tax cut for the wealthy, and uh, seven years later, there was a great yeah. recession. Yeah. A few months ago, we had another tax cut for the wealthy. <laughs> I can see where you're going. I think it'll be sooner than seven years, though. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, seriously. I mean, we, we, I don't think we'll get another 2008, and the savings and loan crisis was not the same as 2008. But I will take what I think is very interesting. Speaking as a European, it was a huge shock to me when I moved here, is just how weird the American mortgage market is. I mean, America, you know, despite all of the rhetoric of, you know, home, you know of, of the American dream and home-owning democracy and so on, it is so dysfunctional and has been dysfunctional for the best part of a century. And every fix that's put in has these extraordinary elements to it. Um, and, you know, one of, the, one of the key elements is that you, you know, to a European, really puzzling is the, is the um, to Brit anyway, is the 30-year fixed mortgage. Now, a 30-year fixed mortgage is obviously a great thing if you're a borrower um, because you make a decision at any given moment, provided you stay in employment, you're fine. But from the point of view of a lender, in a, in a situation of unstable interest rates, it's a catastrophe, especially if it, involves, it also includes an open-ended right to refinance whenever interest rates fall. So from the point of view of the lender, the risk is all on their side. If interest rates go up, they're sitting on a portfolio of mortgages which are worth increasingly little because you can now lend for better rates. So who would want to buy one of these shitty mortgages at 3% or something? And if interest rates go down, the homeowners will refinance and refinance at lower rates. Now, that is not a very sustainable mortgage system. Um, and if you, have a, if you hit a speed bump like the end of Bretton Woods and interest rates soar, it's going to kill any uh, mortgage provider that has, has, has signed up a large portfolio of those kind of fixed interest mortgages. So then what you do is you, you, know, you wheel in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who are going to act as the big shock absorber, and they then decide, and it's a perfectly rational decision, let's securitize this stuff out, which again is a perfectly reasonable decision. But it effectively means that the federal government or the taxpayer in some direct or indirect way is acting as the backstop. Now, this isn't true as far as I know, anywhere in Europe, right? They all have mortgage systems which are actually private. Um, so 
and what what it spawns in the American case is then this you know this creative adaptation of the of the of the of the of the of the, of the securitized Fannie Mae Freddie Mac type mortgage. And of course, again and again, you're going to hit these troubles where Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac mortgages, you can only really absorb that kind of risk if you're very selective about the type of mortgages you take. And then you're basically in a, you know, a racially hierarchical society like the United States with massive income and wealth inequality. That's a recipe for government-sponsored discrimination. Right? Because basically, who can? You have to be a certain type of person to qualify for a conforming loan. Um, so it's a, it's a very, very interesting political economy that, I, you know, setting aside the, your cosmic rhythms of Republican tax cuts, um, one would nevertheless, I think, expect this to be crisis prone uh, because it's hugely politicized. The incentives aren't great um, and it warps the mechanism of funding in a, in a very, very striking way. Uh, and we're not out of the woods at all, right? I mean, the current system has basically just redoubt, fallen back on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who act as... You know, even more powerfully now as the state, as the providers of credit to the American, the American, um, American, uh, American families. It's it's extraordinary. So, yeah, I don't I don't buy the seven year rhythm, but I totally take your point about this sequence of failures of the American mortgage system, and we we don't know it's not fixed at all currently. Any, any, uh, <clears throat> Herb Rose. Uh, I'm looking at the screen there and the question mark, and I'm wondering, uh, and I'm going to ask you to speculate a bit, um, what if uh, a year from now, 15 months from now, Brexit has taken place and we run into another catastrophe and Donald Trump has not yet been impeached or the 25th Amendment has not been enacted, uh, has not been uh, put into effect? Uh, what do you think might happen? No, I, I think that's, a, that's a, it's a, obviously a question on people's minds. Um, <laughs> it's on Hank Paulson's mind. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't have to come along as some kind of left liberal academic and pose the question. Hank Paulson posed that question. That was the, that's why I'm supporting Hillary, he said. Um, let me, let me give you the kind of... It's a little unfair to Donald Trump. Um, I mean, Donald Trump in 2008 and 2009 is full-on supportive of the Obama administration. This is not something he would like you to know now, and certainly while he was in cahoots with Bannon, this was very much suppressed because of Bannon's view of 08. But Donald Trump will go on Republican right-wing talk shows and defend Obama to the hilt. He's the right man doing the right thing. This would have been like... 90, I could have put some quotes up. This would have been much worse than the 1980s. This would have been like the 1930s. We don't like doing this but it's obviously necessary I mean do, um, um, Donald Trump is a pragmatist who knows you know in, if he's in trouble he wants help and he's going to take it so that I mean I, I would you know imagine that he'd be open-minded about what was necessary to save American business um, that would be my, 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 my take on, on Trump personally I'll elaborate on this it's also worth noting of course that he is uh, somebody who has a very large condo building in Chicago uh, in 2008, which he's trying to sell, and it's financed by a European bank, Deutsche Bank. So Donald Trump, I take to be a kind of quintessential expression of this in entire logic, and I would see him on the side of the bailouts rather than on the side, and this is, I think, where the real questions start, of the hardliners inside his own party. For me, the questions would not be about Trump, they'd be about the GOP. Um, and there, I think, there are really very serious questions to be asked. And the dimension of this uh, that I think is most uh, important is the international dimension. You're right, I think, to point to risks outside the United States as the big risks. They're not in Britain, per se, because uh, important as the City of London is to global finance and remains, uh, as Mervyn King quipped, the City of London is like Wimbledon. It's not about the British players. Once every couple of decades a Brit wins Wimbledon, it's about everyone else coming to play in Wimbledon. So the City of London reflects global financial stress. It isn't the product of a domestic crisis in Britain itself. But the Bank of England has analyzed very precisely how the, how the City of London would reflect global financial stress, and that's by way of China. Uh, if there's a banking system in the world that is deeply interconnected with China right now, it's the UK's banking system, and the link is the HSBC Bank, which is currently rated as the second most systemically dangerous bank in the world. Not because it's a badly run bank, but because its business straddles the West and Asia. It has headquarters in Hong Kong and London, and it systematically mediates that risk. Now, some banks got to do it, and it's a very profitable thing for a bank to do, but it means that it's exposed to the possibilities of the Chinese credit cycle going very, very bad. And what I think is really interesting is that question. 
how would America handle a meltdown in China? And the interesting thing is we already kind of have an experiment. Well, we have two experiments. We know how China responds to a meltdown in America, which is cooperatively. In 2008, the Chinese did not pull their money out. They shuffled out of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac into treasuries, but they held faith with Paulson. That one of the reasons he was so urgent about the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac bailout, not that he needed extra reasons, but was that it was the, the conduit for foreign money into the United States. And they honored that. Uh, so the Chinese increased their holdings of American debt all the way up to the first budget crisis of 2011, and then they stopped increasing them. They haven't run them down, however, except in one moment. And that was 2015, 2016, because we've already seen we weren't paying attention because of everything else that was going on uh, in 2015. But um, in the summer of 2015, the Chinese economy really looked as though it was on the skids. The Shanghai stock market was melting down. The yuan was depreciating violently in a way that no one had anticipated. And um, the Chinese dealt with this, or the world dealt with this, in three ways. First of all, the Chinese held their nerve and allowed money to escape from China, which is a, the opposite of the way in which it had been flowing previously, because it turned out that a lot of Chinese private entities had built up big liabilities in dollars. And those are fine so long as dollars are cheap and interest rates are low. But when the dollar appreciates against the Chinese currency and interest rates are going up, you need to unwind those positions urgently. And that produced capital flight out of China. In other words, China had become a little bit like Europe. Its private sector was beginning to be integrated into the United States dollar zone. The Chinese held their nerve. It turned out only, quote, to be a trillion dollars that fled China. They, since they started the crisis with a four trillion dollar reserve, they could absorb that hit. The next thing they did was they imposed exchange controls, tightened capital controls, very big political issue because it's the relationship between Xi and the Chinese oligarchs because they're the people who are trying to get the money out. So it was a sensitive thing, but they tightened controls. But the third thing that's really interesting is the American response. Because if you remember in the summer of 2015, Janet Yellen was talking about actually implementing the taper, raising American interest rates. The American economy was beginning to run towards something like full employment. It was time to do it. And throughout the summer, people were going, will they, won't they, will they, won't they, look what's happening in China. And then August hit, the Shanghai Stock Exchange really plunged, and the yuan fell quite hard. And, sept and in September, Jen Yellen goes before the world's media, and what she's got to tell us is that America will not be raising interest rates, and she says China eight times and global economic conditions 13 times. So at that moment, the Federal Reserve of the United States is conditioning a national economic policy decision on the state of the global economy. That's the kind of collaboration that will be necessary if we continue to have a private sector-dominated global economy which gravitates through force of market logic to dollars as its basic currency. Because if that remains the case, the American Federal Reserve is the anchor of the global financial system, willy-nilly, whatever we like. Compare and contrast that with the situation this spring or late, late early summer where we have the American president you know, happily tweeting about the collapse in the Shanghai Stock Exchange as evidence of America's victory in the trade war. That is not the kind of mood music that we need for this kind of cooperative politics. It may, however, of course, come down to the fact that the Trump administration hands off monetary policy to the Fed, complains a little bit about interest rates, but lets them basically get on with things. But we don't know, really, how this system works in the United States right now. And I think there is certainly a nightmare on a lot of people's minds that is the mood of early 2017 when you had hardliners, Republicans in Congress passing you know, motions mandating that all officials of the US Treasury and the Fed should cease and desist from contact with international agencies until they were able to ensure that the authorities of the United States were acting, quote, in the interests of this country. Now, that is Machtergreifung 1933 kind of language. It premises, assumes that, you know, the, people, the incumbents so far do not care about American national interest, you know, and we will not allow them to have outside contact till we've, we've achieved the purge that we want. That isn't where we've ended up, but that, were, those were, uh, that was the kind of talk in the halls of Congress in the spring of, of 17. <laughs> Quickly coming to an end. Yeah, gentlemen here. Anyone else? Why don't we take two, two final back questions? Back. Mm -hmm. All right. Henry Hetker, uh, I wondered about the price of fuel back in 2008. It reached $140 a barrel, and this helped cause economic paralysis here worldwide. Uh, this could occur again. Oil, uh, lead oil to prices. Another. Yes, yeah. the price of oil. Uh, we're, we're prepared with you know, a national supply of gasoline. We can release it and try to reduce the price of fuel, uh, as President Obama did. It dropped maybe $10 a barrel, and it, it recovered, though, again. It didn't take long, but, I mean, it had a temporary effect. What are they going to do in November? Uh, 
speculators could pr easily push up the price of uh, oil per barrel, doubling it, uh, based on the situation with Iran and threats to close off the Straits of Hormuz. We don't know if this will happen. We're unsure of exactly what the final result will be based on negotiations. But this is something we have to face, and the economy here would be in question if such an event would occur again. Is there any plans to deal with this measure, okay. with Thank this uh, problem? Thank you. And gentlemen there. Yes, Bill Stivers. Um, I have a question about the idea of running hot. I mean, we actually had a very strong example of this earlier in our history, namely World War II. The uh, labor market was very tight, and this was the time when we had the greatest uh, movement out of poverty uh, we'd ever seen, and was also a time when you had saw really the creation of the of a working class that was uh, that was middle class. But then the situation was different. It was a war. You had uh, price controls. You had this idea of everybody everybody uh, uh, pulling together. And um, the question is whether a labor market running hot would uh, produce the same results under the same circumstances. In other words, under the circumstances we now face, wouldn't a sustained running hot of the labor market finally uh, raise the specter again of the Phillips curve? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, I, I'm very conscious of the fact that this book is, is really a, a very limited account of you know, global capitalism and its current operations, despite its size. But that just goes to show that global capitalism and its current operations is a big subject. So you could put, like, six books like this on top of each other and not exhaust the topic. And one of the things I don't really do justice to is oil uh, and commodity prices. Um, so, uh, but let me, like, touch on the ways in which I think it does enter the story. Um, certainly part of the sort of crisis atmosphere of 2007 8 uh, in the United States is the surge of oil prices at that moment. And there is a lot of bullish talk from the Russians in particular, an, an element of the story that I haven't really expanded on here about how Gazprom is going to be the biggest company in the world. And, and when oil prices reach $200 a barrel, uh, Russia and the other oil producers, most of them authoritarian, will call the shocks in a new kind of order that will not, you can see the way that plays out. Um, and there's a very interesting dimension of this that relates directly to the financial crisis, which is that um, uh, there is talk, and I think it's validated, at least to some degree, that what's happening is that the commodity sector has been sucked into the logic of financialization. So as money rotates out of securitized mortgages, it needs to go into something else. And so the financial engineers get busy, and it turns out that you can generate you know, fixed income type securities out of all sorts of things, including commodities. And so there is, a, I think, a powerful logic that says that the spike, not just in oil, but in food prices that we see in the spring of 2008, which is devastating for food importing countries, say in North Africa, um, is driven by that logic of global money circulating out of securitized mortgages. So I'm agreeing with you that the commodity markets through that kind of mechanism generate uh, a fluctuation that we haven't seen before, a new capacity for speculative dynamics. You know, part of the good news story for the American economy, if, if you're not somebody who worries about climate change, that is, is, of course, fracking, uh, which is the technology that moves into that space. Um, and the, the, the way I read the kind of commentary on the global oil situation now is that the advent of this, you know, wonderfully Amer all-American, entrepreneurial, small-scale, incredibly flexible, market-driven technology um, of fracking has really solved this as a geopolitical problem, as America is emerging now as an oil exporter. If only it could actually build enough pipelines to get the stuff out of the new fields uh, to West Texas and onto the old pipeline system, you know, oil would be... It, it changes the logic. Um, on this on this issue of so so to, in summary in to that expect to that respect you know in, in that respect we there's a relative optimism I think and since fracking has been one of the issuers of huge amounts of high yield corporate bonds which go bad whenever oil prices fall and those are quite widely held in the financial system there's a sense in which oil prices higher oil prices might be stabilizing for the American financial system especially if other bits of the economy are going off at that moment anyway this is the kind of thing if you read the Wall Street Journal that's the kind of story that they spin there um, I really love this question about World War II um, because it also brings into of course stark relief the difference between that war and the wars of 2003 and after. Um, compare and contrast, and I think that points rather clearly to the kind of logic that you're pointing towards. Um, fighting wars 
of the World War II type in the context of a New Deal political economy have a dramatic, and if you talk to radical historians, a warping effect on the New Deal from which the New Deal never recovers. It becomes far more conservative. Big business moves its way into Washington, D.C. But everyone, I think, would probably agree with you that in terms of the immediate short-term effects, that kind of total war mobilization under democratic auspices in the sense of more generally the participation of a relatively wide range of social and economic interest groups in the business of mobilization can have the effect of reducing inequality, creating the great compression. I mean, if you read somebody like Thomas Piketty, uh, he'll tell you that inequality has only ever in the modern period been dramatically compressed by wars. Another thing that happens in wars is not just the labor market is tightening, but you feel free to engage in financial repression. So you run inflation a bit higher than interest rates, and that carves away at the money that you owe to bondholders, which is why people like Bernanke and Adam Posen, and I would totally subscribe to this, are asking for us to run 4% right now as a target, because that is a very effective way of rebalancing your fiscal position. And I agree with you that the question now is, what does that look like? What does war fighting under current circumstances look like? And the consequences of 2003 are very different, all the way from the military themselves, who are now a volunteer force that reflects all of the inequality dynamics of American society. Uh, the people who go die come from certain places and not from others. This is no longer a conscript force. To the private contracting systems that feed off that apparatus. Um, to the way in which the Republicans twinned the war with a tax cut for the best off, which you know skewed the fiscal situation. Um, it's very difficult, I think, uh, and that for me is an index of how radically the political economy has shifted. And the anxiety that one pres presumably have as a, as a progressive about running the economy very hot at this moment um, is that it's not obvious that we have the agencies of collective action, that we have trade union representation, which ensure that wages would be smoothly adjusted in line with prices so as to at least hold their position or indeed even possibly take advantage of the boom. What's been astonishing about our current situation, after all, is that hot as the economy is running, real wages are in fact declining last quarter. Real wages were falling last quarter, with unemployment tending towards historically, you know, at least registered, registered unemployment at historically low levels. We'd be lucky, in other words, if we get back to a Phillips curve. I mean, a Phillips curve tells you that you've got some healthy labor market dynamics with people able to kick against inflation if it happens and it affects them. We may be in a world which is quite unlike that, where uh, that kind of adjustment at the collective action level does, just does not happen. And so then the redistribution processes that come from running the economy hot are quite arbitrary. Some people win, some people lose. It's very difficult to know who the winners and losers will be. Um, and, and that, I think, is really quite a, an alarming, but indeed interesting scenario, and one I think you know, one wishes that the progressive parties would actively explore. What is our scenario for running the economy hot? Because that is what we ought to be aspiring to do. And I, I agree with you that simply relying on the experience of the mid-century is not going to be a good guide to our current situation. We've only managed to scratch the surface of what's in this book, but just for your information, there are copies of the book outside this room that you can pick up and delve into uh, at your leisure. Please join us for a reception, and next Monday, please come back to hear Melanie McAllister from GW speak on her new book, The Kingdom of God Has No Borders, A Global History of American Evangelicals. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you, Adam Tooze.